she liked writing. And um, there, there came a time, I think it was in 2004, I think, Ming Bo came to us and asked me to write a column. And I said, no, no, I can't do it. Uh, but Margaret said to me, he said, yes, of course you can. You know, you are natural, so just go, just go and, and write. And so I was persuaded by her, uh, and I took up the column, and I've been writing the column from 2004 to now. I have since written 10 books. Uh, in, I brought the latest one. As uh, Perry said, never miss a chance to advertise. Uh, this is my latest book, my 10th book. Um, I've brought a few copies to give out to people who care to read them. Uh, I write books not to make money. In fact, I have to pay out money. Uh, I write books to give out to people, to give out to you know, yeah, schools, universities, uh, organizations, anybody who wants to, to read them. Uh, I basically write uh, two kinds of uh, 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 things. Uh, I write serious stuff, what I call really heavy stuff, in Singto, and uh, it's, it's, you know, I have to write a longer piece every week, every other week, uh, and it's all about democracy, about social justice, about social issues, and in those articles, I try to be, you know, like, write like a lawyer, which is to write very logically, and, and hopefully to be persuasive to people so that I can get my message across. But what I like most is what I write in Mingbo, which is uh, little pieces about my everyday life, how I feel, and you know, it makes me feel so much better because there are a lot of frustrations. You cannot imagine the frustrations and, and stress that I get as a legislator. Uh, but by writing, it sort of ventilates my, my, my stress and I feel much better. And you know, I like to write like I'm talking to you, and my wife always complains. She says, you can write so much better, and you never say these things to me. <laughs> but yes, it is. In a way, it's easier for you to write than to say something to another person. I have to say face to face, because you feel embarrassed. Um, but writing, I don't feel embarrassed. I just written a piece yet, uh, last week about death, uh, about people are dying, because this is the time of year that, that you know, it, it comes to me. Uh, it's this Ching Ming and, and Bang Wong Wing died, and uh, one of my relatives was diagnosed with uh, late stage cancer. He was absolutely broken, and so it was very heavy. And so I wrote a piece about dying, and, and it, after I'd written it, I felt so much better. And, and I'm happy to say a lot of people who read this article rang me up and, and write to me and say that they, they feel good reading about the article, although it's a very morbid topic about death and dying and, and people, you know, leaving other people. Uh, but I, I think writing uh, is good because you can, you can get a message across in a way sometimes that, that speaking cannot. And likewise, reading can, you know, help you to receive a message which listening cannot. Imagine you're sitting here and listening to me talking to you about death, about religion, about, you know, your dead relatives, about, you know, your son growing up. I mean, you feel bored and, and you wouldn't, you can't absorb the, the message. As much as if you pick up an article, and, and hopefully it's a short one, uh, and you read it through, and you get the message across. And, and I think this is the beauty about writing and the beauty about reading. Uh, I, I like short pieces, I like short stories, uh, because as I said, I've got no time to finish a book, so if it's a book about short stories and short pieces, I can read for 10 minutes and I can, I can come to a stop and I can put it down and I don't have to come back to it maybe for another week or another month. Uh, so I like short uh, uh, articles and short pieces. Uh, and, and even though they're short, they're good because most of these are just about one message. And it's much easier for people to uh, receive one message 
than to try and receive 10 messages at a time. Because your attention span for most people normally is not very long. It's like speaking, I mean, I'm, I'm being told normally you shouldn't speak for more than five minutes or 10 minutes because otherwise people would, would, would lose it, you know, concentration. Uh, and and uh, same for writing. And if it's just about one message in one piece and you can get that message, then it's very good. Not only you know, for the reader, but also for the writer. Uh, well, I guess, you know, what distinguishes professional writers from amateur writers isn't that the former writes for a living. Those people are called poor writers. What distinguishes uh, a professional writer is his genuine and sometimes overdeveloped sense of audience. Well, we write to be read. And this is very important. We write not only to express ourselves, we write to make people understand. We write to communicate with people. <clears throat> you know, sometimes we cater too much to the audience, but sometimes we are too self-indulgent. <clears throat> and this ability to communicate with people, you know, puts writer in a position of influence. <clears throat> you know, the best of Hong Kong writers are all what you will call opinion leaders. <clears throat> they have an influence ov over how people think. And sometimes they have what we call the agenda-setting power. And you know, some writers abuse their power. But in general, you know, this is a good power. This is you know, part of what a free society is all about. You know, we help people understand you know, their societies better. So writing in this sense you know, is a form of participation in self-government. Well, at its best, writing you know, should be a gesture to reach out to the larger community. I guess, you know, I'm a much better person, you know, when I'm writing. You know, I can be very selfish, you know, in real life, but I am very generous and giving when I'm writing. So writing, you know, also helps you read better. You know, if you read well, you write better. If you write well, you can read better. It makes you, you know, there is yet a writer that I know who isn't a good reader. So there is a very intimate relationship between reading and writing. If you read well, you can write well. Thank you. Well said. Thank you. Um, so uh, one of the questions that I have uh, is um, I'd, like to, um, I'd like you to share that one moment in your reading um, that appealed to your sense or sensibility or both, like your emotions or um, so like for Ronnie, maybe that there are a piece that you read that you are very much struck by its logical argument, but at the same time it could also be a piece that appeal to your emotions. So I'd like to, you to share with us uh, a moment um, in reading that you remember that it's appealed to a particular sense or sensibility. Why, why is it you always ask such tough questions? <laughs> Try to organize. Well, I, I can't really think of a, really a book which, uh, um, you know, like what you said, uh, did to me uh, like what you said and, you know, make me shiver down my spine. But um, the, the only recent book that I read, I, I seem to recall I have something close to that feeling is the book by, again, it's a Chinese book, I'm sorry to say, uh, Long Ying Toy. Uh, the book about he wrote letters to his sons. Uh, I can't remember what was it called now. Uh, on that lead, on that lead, yeah. And and again, I just, I just, I just picked the book up and I read from the middle of it. I, I pick up a a letter which he she wrote to the son, and the son wrote back and reminds me so much of my relationship with my son that that, uh, you know, it really touches me in a way that, uh, you know, seldom other books uh, 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 do. That's the, the, the closest I can get to your question. I love that author as well. I read almost all of her books. <laughs> okay, uh, well, I thought you never asked, Kevin. Uh, there is one sentence 
uh, in a book by D.H. Lawrence, one of my favorite books of all time. The studies in classic American literature, you can, you can read all about it um, in my new book, uh, <laughs> you know, which says, never trust the artist, trust the tale. And you know, this has become one of my operating principles as a critic, never trust the artist, trust the tale. Uh, you know, there is you know, a corresponding theory in literary criticism called the death of the artist, or the death of the author. Well, which is, you know, which has really a liberating effect on me. That, you know, criticism is, can be as creative, you know, as, you know, writing your own stories. That you can, you can, you know, get away from what we call the intentional fallacy. You can make sense, you know, of a work of art, you know, in your own ways, you know. So, you know, this is one of the, one of the greatest epiphanies, you know, that I ever had from reading a book. Never trust the artist, trust the tale. There's not much I can add to that. <laughs> but uh, I, I say that uh, it's very hard not to be touched if I'm reading. I cannot think of any specific moments because you usually get touched. If not, I won't be continuing reading, right? So uh, I can also say that for me to want to write about something, I have to be touched. If I'm not affected enough by an experience, I will not write about it. 